Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Peter Nalen, Professor and Head of the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health and Associate Dean for Rural Medicine at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Campus. I'm your host for our program tonight on ENT problems, including sleep apnea. The success of this program is very dependent on you, the viewer. So please call in your questions tonight or send them to our email address. The telephone numbers can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Todd Freeman, an ENT specialist with St. Luke's Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates. Dr. Robert Gruel, an ENT specialist with Essentia Health, and Dr. Thomas Gustafson, a family physician specializing in sleep medicine at both the Grand Itasca Clinic and Hospital in Grand Rapids and Fairview Range in Hibbing. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are Hannah Stry from Big Stone City, South Dakota, Becca Floden from New Prague, Minnesota, and Elsie Johnson from St. Francis, Minnesota. And now on to tonight's program on ENT problems, including sleep apnea. And uh, Dr. Freeman, the first question is for you. Where on the tongue do cancers arise and how do they get noticed? Uh, well, they can arise from anywhere on the tongue. Um, uh, anterior tongue, where you can see them in your mouth, those are typically in smokers and drinkers and they present as a sore spot or a lump or a bump uh, that either bleeds or is uncomfortable. Um, more, more in the last 15 years, we've, though we've had this really blossoming of viral-induced cancers, and they tend to occur on the posterior tongue, uh, below where you can see, and they'll present as oftentimes as a sense of a foreign body uh, or a sore spot back there, or, or many times as a lump in the neck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Gruel, um, what are treatment choices before getting ear tubes? It's a good question. You know, um, a lot of times ear tubes are done for fluid to help clear fluid in the ear that won't clear on its own. So we can try to use anti-inflammatory sprays to help clear the fluid. There are different devices that help release the pressure. And in the last decade or so, we've begun dilating the eustachian tube that's supposed to drain that fluid from the inside through the nose. So those are a few different options before helping ventilate the ear uh, through a different hole, which is, the, uh, which is what an ear tube is. Thank you. And Dr. Gustafson, could you describe for us, please, what is the physical setup of a sleep apnea study for a child? For a child, uh, it's a common question from parents. So as we were talking about backstages, I describe it as coming to a hotel for the night. So I call it painless but annoying. So for parents, it's just we're putting little stickers up on the scalp, uh, no shaving kind of in the hair like the old days. Some stickers on the face, stickers on the chin, a couple stickers on the chest, red light on the finger. There's this little stretchy band that goes around your chest and belly. And then one sticker goes right by your shin bone. I'm not tied to the bed. They just all go into a little box that we're on my neck. And otherwise we try to have you sleep as normal as you can that night. So it's usually not bad. And uh, the parents stay in the room? Yeah, we usually try to have a, a fairly decent sleeper couch for the parent. So if it's a young child, we can have the parent be in bed while they're getting set up and kind of getting comfortable. But once the child falls asleep, we do try to get the parent into that little sleeper couch in the room. Otherwise, sometimes we're picking up the sleep apnea or mm -hmm. issues from the parent sometimes on the kid study. But you can be there with the child the whole night if you need to, but we do try to have a couch there. Thank you. And Dr. Freeman, what are surgical treatments for sleep apnea? Um, th there's been a whole uh, development of different things over, over the years. Um, the one guaranteed thing that can fix them in very severe sleep apnea patients are tracheotomies. We simply put a, bypass the obstructed airway and put a tube in. Um, there, there have been various things tried with different pharyngeal surgeries and tonsil removals with with uh, just a few exceptions, not very good results, um, uh, which has pushed us more into a medical management with, uh, with the most common thing, CPAP. The most recent development has been the Inspire device, which is essentially a, 
a pacer. It senses you're starting to take a breath off a lead that goes to intercostal muscles and then has a stimulating lead that goes to your tongue-based musculature and it um, kind of pushes your tongue forward as you take a breath and physically opens your airway as you're sleeping. It has a little wand that you can start the device, turn it on, and it usually has a delay in onset, so it gives you a chance to fall asleep before, uh, before it starts working. And you gotta remember to turn it off after you wake up. Very uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, for how long has that technology been available? Uh, probably the research has been going on for this, and a lot of it was done through Medtronics in the cities uh, in the ni early 90s, late 80s. Um, the devices have been developed and really gone into practical use in the last five to 10 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Grill, um, after trauma, what are common findings of a broken nose? That's a good question. The most obvious, I suppose, would be that your nose looks different. You know, it could be pushed off to one side, either on top or on bottom. A common find, like if you feel your nose, it's really sore and it feels like there's, you know, like a step off there, like you're falling off. And also when you break the bone, the outer layer that supplies the blood can break. So you can get a bloody nose. Those are the most common signs. Thank you. And uh, a viewer would like to know, how does the CPAP work, Dr. Freeman? Um, you can kind of think of it as an airway splint. First of all, it's the first choice for treatment with this condition. It's very effective. You can wear it for almost everybody with um, obstructive sleep apnea. It's effective. And whether you wear it over your nose or your mouth, it, it, it provides positive pressure when you breathe in, so it essentially uh, helps open your airway so it can't collapse and they're very, they're extremely effective. Thank you. Dr. Grill, another viewer would like to know, if uh, tinnitus gets louder and impacts one's hearing, what else could be done? That's a great question, and people ask that a lot about, the ringing is so loud that I can't hear, and it, if we take a step back, it's you, usually the ringing is from hearing loss, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a chicken or egg situation. You know, um, a lot of people, I would say a majority of people who have ringing, they have hearing loss. So when, when the, the brain's not hearing because the ear is damaged from the hearing loss, there, it kind of fills in that sound. So by amplifying, or like b if people get hearing aids, they kind of replace that sound, they kind of tune it up so that their brain is getting stimulation and hopefully it kind of turns down that ringing. So um, it seems kind of, backwards um, that the ringing makes it feel like you can't hear but if you amplify the sound a little bit you can hear better and hear less ringing oftentimes. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Gustafson, when uh, you're describing the sleep apnea study to adults, um, how do you describe it and do they ask you about testing at home? Yet we get a lot of questions about sleep tests at home and that's become a pretty big percentage of what we do. And the home test can be very straightforward. There's even one that can come through the mail that really is just on the finger and wrist of one hand. So there's nothing on your face or body with that one. But otherwise, an adult sleep test would be almost the exact same as what I described for a child. Where again, just you know, small sticker sensors, kind of head, face, uh, chest. You're not tied to the bed. You can get up to use the bathroom. And most nights we're just getting information. It's rare that we're gonna come ambush you in the middle of the night and put a CPAP on you, though that can come up during a sleep test. And uh, what uh, clinical information is being gathered from the finger and the wrist? Uh, so, uh, actually, a lot. So we're, uh, on this one, when you put the, it looks like a large finger cot to me, gets snug on your finger and actually measures these very minor changes in the uh, muscles in your vessels of your, blood vessels of your finger. Um, and then we're also collecting oxygen. I used to be a computer scientist. So we actually run this through a machine learning algorithm and it did a very good job of identifying obstructive sleep apnea. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Freeman, following up on one of your prior answers, a viewer would like to know, what is causing the increase in cancers of the tongue? It's a, it's a viral induced tumor. It's the human papilloma virus. And the, actually the vast majority of the new tumors we see these days are these human papilloma induced viruses that, um, that start in either the tonsil or the tongue base. Um, 
that's the bad news that we're seeing lots more of them. The good news is they're very amenable to treatment. Um, tumors that formerly you would have very low cure rates, we're having cure rates 80, 90 percentile. Um, um, we know we're over treating them now and a lot of the focus in research for these tumors is trying to de-escalate therapy to try to find the right doses of, of chemotherapy and radiation therapy with or without accompanying surgery to, to effectively treat them, but we're in the process of trying to figure that all out now kind of nationwide. Dr. Gruel, if a, if a patient is recommended to have a tongue biopsy, um, what are some uh, special considerations and any special care the patient needs to do afterward? Um, I guess it sort of depends how big the, the thing is that we're dealing with, but usually a tongue biopsy is not too much noticeable for the person um, afterwards. For example, if somebody has an ulcer, or they, those can be really painful, and if it doesn't go away, sometimes we'll biopsy it, and the biopsy will remove most, if not all, of it. So a lot of people feel better after they get a biopsy because the irritated tissue is removed. And if it's really large or something, we may have them use some mouthwash to help any kind of stitches that are there dissolve or help things kind of heal. But it's generally not too bothersome for people. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, what are tonsil stones and how might they safely be treated or prevented? Well, um, as people if, people, if they have their tonsils and then they get older, the tonsils will tend to get cryptic and pitted. And in the depths of those pits, you collect foods, food particles and bacteria and cells that slough off the lining of your throat and form these little white to yellow concretions. And they um, create irritation in those uh, tonsillar pits and eventually kind of get expressed out. Um, they can um, cause or help, they can be part of chronic tonsillitis, they can contribute to bad breath. Um, as far as treatment, it's just a hygiene issue. Um, gargles, rinses, if, uh, water picks can be real effective in cleaning them out. Um, if people develop pain with them and actually chronic inflammation and discomfort and that's more than three months in duration, um, then people can be a candidate to have them surgically removed, but that's pretty rugged in adults. Hmm. Thank you. Dr. Gustafson, um, are there other good options for sleep apnea treatment beyond the sleep pap, or pardon me, CPAP machine or uh, the implant device? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Dr. Freeman did a good job that CPAP is usually be our gold standard. But if the sleep apnea is not highly severe, there are some mouth guard type devices that we can use that bring my jaw forward to help keep my airway open. Some of us have a very positional sleep apnea where if I'm on my back, it's really severe, but on my side, it's a lot better. So we have these devices called positional therapy. Looks like a fanny pack you're wearing backwards. Helps keep you on your side. Um, kind of mentioned surgical options can be the right choice in some cases. And in very mild sleep apnea, occasionally we even use some kind of anti-decongestant type medications have been helpful. Thank you. And following up, another viewer question, Dr. Gustafson. What is the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? So uh, as Dr. Freeman explained, you know, uh, all these machines are using positive air pressure. So I describe them as blower fans in a box. A CPAP is continuous or constant, just like Dr. Freeman said. A BiPAP or a bi-level, still constant pressure, but it can, we can change the amount of air pressure when I'm breathing in versus breathing out. So that can treat sleep apnea, but we can also help people with things like COPD or other breathing problems with the machines with a BiPAP. Thank you. Dr. Gruel, uh, a caller wants to know, would Spireva be helpful with sleep apnea? Ooh, um, I suppose, you know, inhalers for the lungs, if they had, and maybe if, if you had anything else to say about it, <laughs> I wouldn't say directly for sleep apnea. Usually not much. The, the best success we've had, and this is with kids, is things like uh, Flonase, uh, nasal saline, and uh, Singular. We've had some success. Okay, very well. And um, another caller asked for just a little more explanation about the mouth guards for sleep apnea. Yeah, so they come in two flavors. I call it the professional model and the self-fit model. So you can find these online. They're usually sold as anti-snoring mouth guards. 
but the professional version is actually fit and made by a dentist, but hopefully covered under medical insurance, even though it's made by a dentist. To me, it looks like, I don't say a brand name, Invisalign, the little trays people wear instead of braces. I say envision those, but we're attaching the top piece to the bottom piece, so it's a single unit, and now we can bring your jaw forward and keep it there while you sleep. So worn just at nighttime. Thank you. And Dr. Freeman, do your patients ask about any natural remedies for ringing in the ears? Yeah, I mean, and there's been tons of things studied for tinnitus, everything from brewer's yeast to acupuncture, and the results are dismal. Um, avoiding caffeine is really important. Staying well rested because fatigue really contributes to it. Um, if you have anxiety or depression issues, get those addressed with your primary doctor because managing those can dramatically reduce at least how much tinnitus is bothering people. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, if your hearing isn't bad enough, that hearing aid won't help you, just kind of strategic use of masking sounds. Uh, every, I think people are pretty familiar with these sound devices people use for kids for sleep that make like running water sound or gentle wave action sound, um, even or just even a fan in the background, but some low level sound input, because um, anything external to your body seems to, seems to be much more well tolerated than the tinnitus generated inside your body. Interesting, thank you. Dr. Grill, uh, a caller asks about um, ear impactions that actually cause pain and what might be a, a strategy for addressing that? Um, yeah, so you can definitely get earwax. Like, e earwax is normal, you know, it's, it's, it's made by the sweat glands in the ear and it serves to kind of hydrate the skin of your ear canal. So people try and clean it out. It's kind of like washing your hands too much it can get dry and itchy, you know? But um, on the other side of it, you can get so much wax build up and it can get hard and uncomfortable. So in that case, you should have it removed, which is sometimes done by means of irrigation, kind of squeezing it out or the use of hydrogen peroxide, or we use a little microscope to pull it out gently. Um, sometimes though, people who have discomfort they, c they can have other things going on, like eczema in the ear canal, and um, there are different ways that we can help deal with that. Or um, sometimes people have like a little piece of lead or a little piece of a twig that, ha that came off during yard work and is stuck in their ear. So if the ear's uncomfortable, you should definitely have somebody look at it. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Gustafson, how might you uh, advise a patient who reports food getting stuck in the upper part of the throat while eating? Um, just like, uh, that might be best. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about maybe, do you guys have a better answer for it, for dysphagia? You know, when you're, dysphagia is the medical term for swallowing difficulties, and it can be, it can occur at various levels in your swallowing mechanism. It can be an oral preparatory problem, um, with like a neuromuscular disorder. It can be a pharyngeal problem, an upper throat problem. And the, probably the most common, one of the more common things we see causing that is um, a spasm of the upper esophageal sphincter behind the voice box from acid reflux. And oftentimes people who have that are unaware. Uh, they don't have classic GERD symptoms of heartburn or, or substernal pain or epigastric pain. They just have their throat symptom. Um, but it's pretty important to have a look at those. I mean, I think it's reasonable if you start having a sensation of food in your throat to try an over-the-counter acid suppression medicine, but if you aren't pretty promptly getting better within a few weeks, it's something that should be looked at. Thank you. Dr. Grill, a, a viewer asks from Two Harbors, how serious is a perforated septum? Um, well, in terms of it affecting your everyday life, Usually it's not too big of a deal. The question, whenever we look in the nose and see that there's a hole that, um, like people aren't born that way, Some, something happened to make that hole. And the usual cause is trauma, like somebody broke their nose, they didn't know it, a blood collection formed, and over time it kind of damaged the septum. It can also be from other things like drug use in the nose or even like really aggressive nasal spray use. But there are other causes like autoimmune diseases that can cause a hole in the septum. So if we can't find another good reason for the hole, we just wanna rule those things out. 
And beyond that, it can just be kind of dry and annoying and create crusting and bleeding. And it honestly is also a really hard problem to fix. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, why do wrestlers wear protection over their ears? Because if they don't, they'll end up looking like Dan Gable. If anybody's a wrestling fan, you'll, you'll see a condition called cauliflower ear where the, the ear gets really um, swollen and hard and you can't fix it once it's formed. So the, the thing to do is to wear these protective coverings over your ears so you don't get this um, hematoma or collection of fluid in the ear that can essentially solidif solidify or calcify and cause a very distorted ear. So it's, it's trying to prevent that Dan Gable ear from occurring. And the fluid can be uh, bloody or serous fluid? Mm -hmm. Can be either. Okay. Usually the bloody, the more acute ones are, tend to be bloody and as they become more chronic you tend to see more of serous fluid in there. Dr. Grohl, um, again about uh, tinnitus ringing in the ears, is the evaluation similar or different for ringing in one ear or both ears? I think that's, that's a great question and um, you know everything in your body you kind of think should be pretty much the same on one side versus the other, you know. so. Um, if you have something that's, you know, if you have blurry vision in one eye or if you have ringing in one ear, you should have that, def have that evaluated. Usually the first thing we do is get a hearing test and it could be that your hearing is different in that ear and in, in that situation, I mean there's a bunch of different qualities and we usually try to break it down. Does it sound like your heartbeat or does it sound not like your heartbeat and the evaluation kind of goes a little bit different direction from there in terms of what types of imaging or other tests we should do. Dr. Gustafson, for the patients who have sleep apnea, are there medications that you either recommend adding or uh, carefully removing? Say so right now there's nothing specifically we recommend adding that might be changing in the near future with a lot of people have heard of some of these GLP-1 uh, medicines are used for a lot of times for weight loss and diabetes. There may be some benefits there that we're learning about. Uh, usually we're more often watching or taking away medications. And there's usually pain medications, so like classically opiates. Uh, we're careful about things like alcohol um, and some kind of anti-anxiety medicines we're also careful with. But most we're usually are not of a concern for it. Thank you, and this question is about the description of good candidates for a cochlear implant. Dr. Freeman? Well, it's really interesting when I was a resident and finishing only the most profoundly deaf people got, got um, cochlear implants and when they did, a lot of times the most you could hope for was just some vague sound perception. And now um, people get, uh, can get dramatic um, word understanding with cochlear implants and as a result of the improving technology, uh, uh, we have a lower and lower threshold to send people on for them. Um, I mean, you can have hearing losses in the in the 60 decibel range, which formerly, which oftentimes you can treat with a with hearing hearing aids. But particularly if their word understanding is going down, uh, then they can be considered candidates uh, for for the cochlear implant. So it depends on hearing levels, but certainly the hearing levels uh, that that we used to wait to see before we'd send them are nothing like the hearing levels now. I mean, the devices are so much better and they can expect so much improvement from them. Thank you. Dr. Grill, a uh, viewer asks, what would be recommended to uh, prevent or reduce episodes of Meniere's disease? Well, somebody must have some experience with the disease to ask about it, but um, the number one treatment, and there's a whole guideline set on it, is um, we think that it's related to a buildup of fluid in the inner ear, the part that we can't see from the outside. So we try to reduce the pressure, primarily by really strict salt restriction in the diet. And um, we try to flush some more out with some, uh, with some diuretics, some water pills, and then avoiding triggers, a lot of the same triggers that Dr. Freeman described for tinnitus, like alcohol, fatigue, stress, all those things can trigger Meniere's flare-ups. Um, caffeine, so um, salt restriction is the primary treatment and there are some medications and lifestyle things that can help as well. And uh, Dr. Freeman, we might have time for this question. What are causes for the production of more saliva that is actually per persisting? Yeah, when people are drooling, 
that's the question. Is it is it overproduction or ineffective clearing of the saliva? And it, it can be a frustrating problem to deal with. It can be um, medication side effects, but not terribly common. Um, uh, and it, yeah, it's frustrating. Uh, and mm -hmm. usually, it's about dressing swallowing. Thank you. And I do want to thank our panelists, Dr. Todd Freeman, Dr. Robert Gruhl, and Dr. Thomas Gustafson, and our medical student volunteers, Hannah Stry, Becca Floden, and Elsie Johnson. Please join Dr. Dina Claybaugh next week for a program on mental health for families and couples. Thank you for watching. Good night.